Hello everyone, I am Perry Nemroff and I'm back with another Collider Videos interview. We are so lucky today because we have the director of the movie The Light Between Oceans with us. We have Derek C in France. I pronounced it right, right? That's right, you did a good job. Yeah. I feel like because you have the word France in your last name, everyone thinks you're, you're French or like puts, a, puts an accent on it, no? They do. They put accents on it. Yeah, but half of my family, and I'm from Colorado, half of my family, uh, like my great uncle, they changed their last name just to France. It was Chan Ferrani was the original name, but you know, I have a whole group of my family that's just named France. Well, so, I'm glad we cleared that up. Now we yeah. can pronounce it correctly in all of our Collider News exactly. videos. See in France, yes, yes. So this movie is one heck of a follow-up to Blue Valentine and the place Beyond the Pines. Mm. Can you tell me a little bit about making the transition from one to the other, just for you personally as a mm. director? Is there any reason you chose this as your next film? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, look, after The Place Beyond the Pines, I was like sick of myself, and I was sick of my own ideas, and uh, I really wanted to find an adaptation, so I, I searched for like a year trying to find something that made sense to me, and I became like kind of desperate because everything I would read was uh, I just couldn't understand it. I had no idea, honestly, what was going on in these scripts that I was reading and these books that I was reading. And I thought, maybe I'm not meant to make an adaptation. And then uh, I found myself at DreamWorks for a meeting and because uh, Steven Spielberg had been like a big fan of Blue Valentine. That was like his favorite movie of 2010, which kind of made sense to me because to me, Blue Valentine was like E.T. without the alien, you know? Um, you know, we both come from the suburbs, so like we were both making suburban kind of nightmare movies. Um, anyway, mine was a little different, but anyway, he gave me a, they gave me a pile of books, and the one, the one on the top was *The Light Between Oceans*. And I thought to myself, well, that's kind of a cinematic idea there, like a lighthouse keeper. I mean, you know, what what is cinema but a light shining through a lens and projecting into the darkness? Um, and so I said, let me. This is intriguing, so let me take a look here. And I started, uh, you know, reading the story, and it's about a man who lives on a lighthouse on, on this island with his wife, and they share this great secret. And, you know, when I was a kid, I used to think people lived on islands. I used to think uh, my house was an island because when people would come over, I would always notice that we would change inside our house. We would act differently. We would become like the most charming versions of ourselves. And then people would leave, and we'd go back to being real again. And I know when I go to friends' houses, the same thing would happen. I'd be down in their basement, like playing pinball, and eventually I'd hear their parents start to like uh, they'd had too much to drink, and I'd hear their parents start to uh, you know fight each other upstairs. And so I always had this idea from being a child that people were lived on islands, and that homes were islands, and that families were places where great secrets were kept. And it's been kind of my mission as a filmmaker to tell stories, to make movies about those families and those secrets and uh and i'm always just trying to make home movies really uh movies about families um and try to bring out that truth that happens on those islands and so this was like a literal manifestation of that metaphor that i always imagined and you know then uh, you know it dealt with similar themes questions of paternity and uh you know, love between, uh, you know, between a husband and wife and kind of the, you know, the, the, what happens over the course of time to that love and, and legacy. And, and then, you know, eventually by the end of the book, I was on the C train in New York City and I was, I was just in, in tears, you know, uh, because I felt it, I found it to be so cathartic. And uh, it was embarrassing, honestly, to be cry, to cry. Have you ever cried in public? I have. I cried on the L I R reading the end of Marley and Me. There you go. Yep. Yes. So I you, cried you some know. serious tears there on that train. Go. It was awful. It's embarrassing, right? It's the worst thing to cry in public. But I th the only the, the light at the end of the tunnel for me was that if any of those people on that crowded subway were reading what I was reading, I felt like they would be having the same experience. And I think it's good to have uh, kind of that emotional cleansing. And so I went out full force to to uh, do you know to do this to turn this into a movie and it took like eight months of like convincing all the powers that be to uh, you know give me a shot at it and by the time I had a shot at it I just uh, you know I felt like I was born to make it and it felt like my you know it felt like uh, you know a movie that was that was mine it didn't feel any different than uh, the other movies actually that's a good segue what is your mm -hmm. what was your experience like adapting your first book because we're constantly talking about that on all of our shows mm -hmm. because people are very precious about something they love so mm -hmm. how exactly exactly did you go about figuring out what needed to be changed and what needed to stay true to the source material? It was all instinct. I mean, honestly, uh, you know, by the time I finally got the rights to do the book, I had it memorized, you know, and my North Star while I was adapting it was always my emotional reaction I had when I first read it. Um, 
So the process of adapting something, look, the literary medium and the cinematic medium are different. They're two totally different mediums. You, mediums. you cannot film the book. You cannot copy the book on a page and then go shoot that. That's not what I did. It's a process of choices that you make. It's a pro process of sculpture, really. Um, it's more of an editing process, uh, you know, initially when you do an adaptation, and then it's a, and then it's you start changing things to work for cinema. You know, for instance, in this movie, you know, it, there's a lot of differences from the book, but still the heart is like the same to me. Again, like that was my emotional north north star, and then eventually you get to a place where the 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 words on the page and the original concept is inspiring new ideas and you know i look up here i see michael fassbender with a mustache right there and he's got no mustache right there that's not in the book you know like that was michael's idea that maybe he could grow a mustache you know um and so anyway and the way i like to shoot you know i'm always trying to find uh you know moments that are that are fresh and moments that are new and moments that you can't repeat and can't happen again and so once i get to set you know i have this document and i have this structure that kind of keeps us in line but if that's all i get is the script i'm always going to be incredibly disappointed what i'm always trying to do as a filmmaker i'm trying to find a place where the story stops and where life begins and with performances i'm trying to find a place where acting stops and being begins or behavior begins and uh and so that 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 story, that North Star that I had, just becomes like an instigation point to me when Does I start that shooting. Process make it more challenging for you to, as a director to direct something like this because we have a lot of characters in this movie who make questionable decisions. Mm. So are you allowed to judge them yourself as a director, or do you have to kind of pull back in that respect? Uh, I never judge my characters, and I'm always dealing with people in my movies who you could say they make questionable decisions. Um, in my life, I don't, I've never met a hero. In my life, I've never met a true villain either. Um, I remember years ago, I was on jury duty and I had this confounding experience on jury duty and that was when the prosecution was speaking, I was absolutely certain that the guy was guilty until the defense came up and started speaking. And then once the defense started speaking, I was absolutely certain he was innocent. And I had that same experience reading this book. You know, I had the same experience of like kind of flip-flopping about who did what and who was right. And I came to realize that the author of the book, M.L. Stedman, was a lawyer. And I, f and I started to think who better than a lawyer to understand human empathy. And um, that's what I've tried to do in all of my movies is nobody in any of my movies, and this movie is no exception, nobody makes choices out of you know, to intentionally hurt someone else. People make choices usually with good, with good intentions, but every choice that anyone makes has a consequence. And I'm kind of obsessed with consequence. You know, I'm a Catholic. I grew up Catholic, and so I have, like, a lot of guilt about everything I do and every choice I make, and my movies are kind of obsessed with reverberations of choices um, without judging. Well, you can definitely see that here. Can you yeah. tell me a little bit about your work as an actor's director now? Mm. How do you pull those kinds of performances out of your actors? Because, I mean, you have three in particular in this movie that are pretty damn incredible. Yeah. Well, they're great actors to begin with. You know, I've been really fortunate uh, with the actors that I've worked with. You know, I've been long been a fan of Michael's and... Uh, with Alicia, you know, I, I, I had no idea who was going to play Isabel in this movie. And, you know, I told my casting director that, you know, I, I said, this is a character who is right on the surface, right? There, her, she is her emotions. So if she falls in love with you, she's going to ask you to marry her. If she finds a baby, she's going to want to keep it. If you betray her, she's never going to speak to you again. If she laughs, she's going to be the loud. If she finds something funny, she's going to laugh louder than anyone in the room. I said, so I need to find someone who can do that, an actor that can do that. And she said, well, give me some examples. I said, well, Vivian Lee in Gone with the Wind, or Jenna Rollins in Woman Under the Influence, or Emily Watson in Breaking the Waves. Those are my three favorite performances. I said, I need someone. I need those those three ladies. And she said, okay, you should meet Alicia Vikander. You know? so, um, and this was before Danish Girl, before... Um, you know, ex machina, mm -hmm. and uh, and you know, so it's about casting it right first. That's what you have to do. I felt like Alicia and Michael could like fit together on screen. I felt like there would be a chemistry there um, for them. Um, and then the second thing I do with actors is, you know, I mean, I do so many things with actors. I mean, I tell them first thing I tell them is 
that they can do two things for me. To, uh, they can fail and they can surprise me. Those are the two biggest gifts they can give me. And then I try to set up a series. I try to give them an experience on set, honestly. Um, you know, this movie we were shooting in this Cape Campbell lighthouse, which is in on the su South Island of New Zealand. And uh, it was like an hour and a half down a bumpy dirt road from any kind of civilization. And that was good because I wanted to have an isolated movie I wanted to have an isolated experience and I remember the studio at the beginning said well that's crazy because you're gonna spend three and a half hours a day just driving to and from set and I said no we're not gonna drive to and from set we're gonna live there and they said are you that's impossible you're how can you we can't put 70 people up on the island I was like great I don't want 70 people give me 12 people give me a DP give me a couple camera assistants give me a sound guy give me a boom guy give me my AD Mariella and you know you just, yeah, I don't need much and so they, they said that's crazy you can't make a movie for that much they're like how are you gonna set up the green screens I said well there's no green screens in this movie we're going back to a primal time all I need is the wind and the sea and the sun and they said what happens if it gets dark and you haven't made it I said well we'll wait we'll make it or we'll shoot in the dark what happens if it rains well we'll shoot in the rain so anyway they're like okay finally they they said okay fine you can do it but you're never gonna convince the actors to do it. And I said, okay, let me ask them. So I called up Michael and I said, Michael, I need you to live on this lighthouse with me. And he was like, isn't that a bit extreme? And I said, well, this is, I was like, Michael, look, I, there's nothing, you're a great actor. There's nothing I can tell you. There's nothing I can whisper in your ear that's gonna like make your performance great. I said, but what I can do for you is give you an experience. And I don't know, did you ever hear that story about like Dustin Hoffman and Lawrence Olivier? I don't think like so. Like with Mar Marathon Man, apparently like Dustin Hoffman was staying up all night and like night after night and he came like all frazzled to set and Lawrence Olivier said, try acting kid, it's easier. So anyway, that's kind of what Michael told me. He was like, you know, we don't need this. And I was like, just give me a shot. And he said, okay, I'll give you one night. I'll try it for one night. And flash forward five and a half weeks later, I had to pull him out of the, uh, out of the location. <laughs> you know, he didn't want to leave. And the same with Alicia. And what we were able to do was live it. And we were able to, you know, I'll, I'll never forget, like, the first three days of shooting with Michael, we did nothing but live there, right? So the first thing he did was clean the lens of the lighthouse. He spent all morning cleaning the lens. He got hungry afterwards, so he had to eat something. So there was a wood stove in the house, so he had to start a fire on the wood stove, and then he had to cook something. So there was a chicken coop that had uh, a lot of chickens, and there was fresh eggs there every day, so he got himself a couple eggs, and then there was like a cool box in the back of the house that had some bacon under a fly paper, and we, you know, he carved him, you know, cut himself up some bacon, and he made his own breakfast. We shot that. Uh, there was goats there that he had to milk. Um, there was a garden there that he had to tend. There was a bed there that he had to make. And we just lived there for three days. I remember he asked my costume designer in the middle of the third day, he was like, what have we been doing? When are we gonna start shooting the movie? And my costume designer, Aaron Bennick, had done two movies with me, and she said, this is the movie, this is what we're doing. And then he was in his woodshed, and he was working on something in the place, and I remember I whispered to him, I said, say a prayer for yourself. And he kneeled down and he started praying and he, he lost it. He started crying. And it was the moment, again, I said I was Catholic. There's that moment in Catholicism, this idea of transmutation, I think it's called, where water and wine become one. Um, Michael and Tom became one at that point. And it's that process that I'm like fascinated it, it with as a, as a filmmaker. And, and it's that process that allows me to create moments that are fleeting moments. That process is also incredibly hard to edit. You know, I spent uh, almost 15 months in the editing room with this movie because I've shot over 209 hours of footage and I'm not only shooting what's in the script, again, I'm trying to use the script to inspire and instigate the life that then we will capture on set. And in a lot of ways, I feel like I'm a documentary in a fiction. This is a really unique approach to this. And I wanted to ask you now mm. what you're looking to do next. Do you want to stay in this realm? And, you know, nowadays we're constantly seeing independent directors or, or non-studio blockbuster directors getting scooped up to direct superhero mm. movies and Star Wars movies. I don't see you doing that. But if someone ever came mm. to you with an offer like that, is that something you would consider bringing this process to that type of movie? Um... Well, but my next film I'm going to make is called Empire of the Summer Moon for Warner Brothers. It's uh, based on S.C. Gwynn's uh, history of the Comanche Nation. And uh, 
It takes place in the 1860s. It's about Quanah Parker, you know, the last great Comanche chief of the of the Plains Indians. And um, you know, to me, that's a very uh, you know, I want to tell that American story. I want to tell that story that happened in the landscape of the America that I grew up near. And, uh, and you know, that landscape now is, feels like it's covered with Home Depots, but I want to see what, I want to, I want to explore this other time there. You know, I want to go back to this other state. And, um, and then after that, I'll go back. I have another movie that I'm, an original that I'm working on. I have some other things, uh, you know, that I'm working on. But look, I've, I've had a, I've had a good, a good, uh, I've been fortunate enough uh, recently to be able to make the films that I want to see. Um, you know, uh, I, I direct commercials in my off time and I direct commercials really so I can buy my time back. I, I direct commercials so my art can be completely free. I don't ever have to really make a living off of the movies I make because, um, yeah, I don't, I don't need to because I can make commercials as long as, as long as I can keep, uh, milk in that cow, I'll have milk. As long as there's water in the well, I'll still have water there. So, um, anyway, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of my plan. I mean, no one's, uh, you know, they've, 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 uh, I've, I've gotten some crazy scripts come over. You know, for movies that I couldn't understand. I, you know, I could, I would never be opposed to making a bigger film like that or like some kind of. I mean, although Empire of Summer Moon is going to be as epic as it gets. Is that going to be your biggest production yet? Without a doubt, yeah. yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. a that's a the definition of epic. That's awesome. I'm I'm looking forward to uh, seeing you take that next step. And this is a beautiful beautiful movie as well. So thank you. Huge congratulations Thanks. on it. So go check out Light Between Oceans. Hits theaters nationwide on September 2nd. Is that correct? September 2nd. September yeah. 2nd. So go check it out, Derek. Thank you so much for coming thank out you. today. This has been wonderful. Thank you. Go see the movie September 2nd, and we'll see you guys soon. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.